Welcome to Mission Impossible, Carpooling the Triangle. So let me start off by saying you're not crazy. That is opossum. And we are saying opossum. Um, we're going to explain why we're using that today. That's our terminology today. Uh, but first, we'd like to learn a little more um, about you to kick things off. So please take a moment to type your name in the chat um, and let us kind of know where you're coming from today. And then we'd also like to know how you spell the name of this furry little friend. Um, do you spell it P-O-S-S-U-M or O-P-O-S-S-U-M? It's been a subject of hot and intense debate uh, within our planning committee these past few weeks as we've been getting this webinar put together. Um, and so we'd like to have your input on it uh, just to know which one is correct and hopefully prove me right, honestly, if we're going to be, be real about it. Um, so welcome again, everyone. My name is Mason Shambly. I am a Commute Smart Consultant with the City of Raleigh, and I'll be your host today. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us and is joining us as we're going uh, through our warm-ups. Um, I'd also like to thank our regional chambers, business membership organizations, and sustainable transportation community um, that helped spread the word about this webinar. Um, so before getting into today's presentation, we have a few housekeeping items. Um, today's session is being recorded, and we will Send that recording out. Usually it's within 24 to 48 hours once we're done. Um, and then I'm sure, you know, after two years, everyone's pretty familiar with Zoom and all of its functionalities. But we are in webinar today, uh, which means you don't have to worry about your cameras or your video screens um, or audio or anything like that. Uh, so relax. Um, chill out. We're going to have a great time here today. Um, we are asking attendees to use the Q&A function instead of the chat if you have any questions. Um, that just helps it keep it streamlined for us. It makes it easier to make sure we get to any questions that you have. And then finally, we have enabled the live transcription services, um, and subtitles can be shown by accessing the live transcript option in the Zoom toolbar. Um, and so as we are starting today, I kind of want to go over a little bit more about the Mission Impossible webinar and its series. So Go Triangle is hosting today's Mission Impossible. Uh, but I want to make sure you knew more about the services that are offered through the regional through our regional employer services program. Through employer services, we offer transportation expertise and complementary assistance to businesses, residential communities, and commercial properties to give them a competitive edge and help improve transportation and commuter benefits. These services and programs significantly impact computing patterns, traffic congestion, personal health, and air quality in the triangle. Our grant funded services programs and materials are provided through a partnership of municipalities and public transportation. Uh, these services and outcomes are referred to as Transportation Demand Management, or TDM. To learn more about these services that are provided and offered, please visit gotriangle.org slash employer dash services to learn more. Um, and we'll have that URL in the chat so it's easier for you to, to go to. Um, and again, I would like to give a tremendous amount of thanks um, to all the people who help support us. A tremendous amount of work does go into these Mission Impossible webinars, and we cannot do it without the support of our members from our Regional Transportation Choices programs. Um, so first, I would like to thank our regional partners. That's Way to Go Durham and the City of Durham, Commute Smart Raleigh and the City of Raleigh, Orange County, Research Triangle Park, Go Chapel Hill, Wake County, and of course, Go Triangle. Um, I also like to thank our university partners, North Carolina Central University, Wake Tech, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, North Carolina State University, and Duke University. Um, lastly, a big thank you to our funders and program administrators, uh, North Carolina Capital Area Metro, Metropolitan Planning Organization, or CAMPO, Durham, Chapel Hill, Harborough Metropolitan Planning Organization, or DCHC, North Carolina Department of Transportation, and the Triangle J Council of Governments. And then finally, I'd like to give a big, big thank you um, to our planning committee volunteers who took time out of their normal work day um, to help us plan this webinar. So special thank you to Lynn Cohn from Chapel Hill, Amanda Simmons from UNC at Chapel Hill, uh, Zach Lane from Wake Tech, Callie Britt at Go Triangle, um, Amy Eckberg at Orange County, Patricia Crane at Go Triangle, and then Kim Johnson at Go Triangle too. So the Mission Impossible, not Impossible, which we'll get to in a moment. So, uh, but the Mission Impossible series is a quick 60 minute discussion with experts on topics that you want to know more about. This includes practical lessons that provide direct access to our industry and technical experts. 
We know you have questions, and what better way to address them than in a discussion with subject matter experts and your peers for the most productive 60 minutes of your day. Um, visit gotriangle.org slash mi to learn more about our Mission Impossible series uh, and to watch any of the webinars you see displayed on the screen. So now that you know what Mission Impossible is, uh, but what about Mission Impossible? I know you want to know about these possums, but first I want to introduce today's presenter. And he's going to help explain that and so much more. So Paul Straw began his career in sustainable transportation in 2010 at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments in D.C., where he helped oversee the Commuter Connections Transportation Demand Management Program. And this included carpool and database management, as well as involving a network of all Washington, D.C. area local governments, federal agencies, transportation management associations, and government agencies from Baltimore, Southern Maryland, and Northern Virginia. In 2013, he, go, he joined Go Triangle, formerly known as Triangle Transit, to, and helped transition the local TDM partnership to an upgraded platform for Share the Ride NC, uh, where he is currently the administrator of that website and the database. He also oversees the Emergency Ride at Home program and database management of our Go Perks Incentive program. So, Paul, I'll give it to you. Great. Yeah, thank you, Mason. I appreciate it. Um, Mason had recognized our planning committee members earlier, and I'd like to thank them as well and, and really give a big thank you to Mason for hosting today. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'd also like to give a really big thank you to Chris Clark uh, with Go Triangle, our graphic designer. He's created a lot of the uh, adorable possums that you've probably seen so far and we're going to see throughout today's presentation. So, so a uh, big thank you, Chris. Um, so I'll just scroll here on the screen so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so Mission Impossible started for several reasons. Uh, first, we have so much information to share concerning ride matching and carpooling that it made sense to develop an educational resource for the public. And we developed an absolutely amazing carpool toolkit, which you can see on this screen. And I'll scroll through a little bit of the options here. Um, um, and so as this toolkit was being developed and we were brainstorming how to have a bit of fun with it, uh, we started talking about how possums are nature's carpool. And then someone says, uh, imagine the po possibilities. And, and yes, before you know it, uh, we developed a toolkit and a webinar off of a silly yet lovable pun. Uh, but additionally, and this might be a, an odd analogy, I do think that possums are akin to carpooling because the more you learn about them, the more you appreciate them. Um, you know, possums are these like amazing creatures that are naturally immune to rabies and can't catch or carry Lyme disease. They eat up to 5,000 ticks per year. So, so they're working for it. And uh, all this is to say that when you learn about something, you appreciate it that much more. And, and I hope that's what you're gonna get from today's webinar as we talk about carpooling in the triangle. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, a great many of the items that are in this carpool toolkit uh, today, but be sure to stick around to the end of the webinar to find out how to receive your own toolkit. I'm gonna hold up a little version of this, hopefully that comes in um, uh, so we can get you your own version of the toolkit. Um, and you can visit us at local events to get a copy of this. Uh, we'll be handing out different toolkits, uh, but the Car Carpool Toolkit is loaded with helpful information. There's a big section in there to take notes. There's a possum sticker. Uh, so it's really, really cool. Um, so a digital version of this toolkit can be found at gotriangle.org slash strnc. We're going to drop that link in chat. You might see Kim Johnson uh, posting some of these links here. Appreciate it, Kim. Thanks for doing some, some of the hard work here. Uh, if you have questions, you can also uh, reach out to Kim. She's a fantastic resource as we go through this. And so we have a whole lot to cover today. Um, um, so I wanted to kind of come up with a, an agenda of items. Um, first, we're going to talk about the terminology of carpooling. I think that's really important. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to have a little bit of the history of carpooling, something that maybe we didn't know about going into this. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the benefits and the tips to carpooling, how to find a carpool. Obviously, that's super important in this conversation. Uh, and we're going to explore the programs and services that make carpooling what I feel, uh, one of the best sustainable transportation options available. So, all right, let's kind of dive into what is carpooling. To provide sort of a generic term, um, carpooling is an arrangement between people to make a journey together in a single vehicle. Um, but I'd like to expand on that definition because carpooling might have a different meaning or possible connotation to you. Um, so here you see that I've broken carpooling into three different categories. So that you know, term carpooling can also refer to a term like ride share or car share. There are then things like um, family carpools or sometimes we nickname that fam pool. 
and often these are associated with like your long school pool carpool lines um, and then there are ride hailing services like uber and lyft uh, these are gig economy work uh, we in our industry we re refer to these as transportation network companies or tncs um, but to kind of dive into a little bit more, so with ride share or traditional carpooling, as we often like to call it, that kind of left option that we're looking at on the screen, uh, it is that arrangement between at least two or more people with a common origin and a destination to, to take a trip together in a single vehicle. This often means establishing a reoccurring trip. Um, and that could be the, for the purposes of commuting into work or maybe going to your college or university for that commute. Um, Rideshare can also mean one-time trips to events, things like concerts or you know, helping get these college students um, home for winter or spring break. Um, some of you might've even heard terms like slugging. Um, it's not as common here, but that's also a casual carpooling term. Um, it's sort of the practice of forming ad hoc and formal carpools for the purposes of commuting, um, sort of a variation on ride sharing. Um, and so we see those in places like Washington, DC, San Francisco, Houston, not as much here in the triangle, but that's one of these terms that kind of pops up whenever you're looking into to, to ride sharing services. Um, to talk a little bit more about the fam pool, um, family pool, that middle option here on the screen, it can represent uh, what we call naturally forming carpools, usually between family members, a spouse, a partner, close friends, maybe a mother possum with their joeys. That's kind of what we look at for um, family carpooling. And, and these are wonderful. It's kind of important to make that distinction between ride share and family carpooling, because sometimes you have to make a conscious effort to make ride share happen where family carpooling or this natural forming carpool just sort of take shape um, naturally. Uh, and then we have the ride hailing services. That ride option on the screen um, means payment is required. Typically, um, there's usually like a financial gain from the transportation services provided. Uh, the media can sometimes make that mistake of calling ride hailing services carpooling. Uh, for us, we really like to make that uh, distinction and terminology important because we do feel like ride hailing services can be very beneficial and very helpful. That is slightly different than carpooling as far as the, the terminology behind those uh, words. All right, so I thought it would be fun, and let's just play this video, zip it along here, um, to talk a little bit about the history of carpooling. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, so we're going to take a trip down this timeline. I will have a few slides for this. Uh, this video that we see on the screen is actually from 1906 in San Francisco. I just thought it looked really cool, so I threw it in here. Uh, but we're actually going to start at 1908, uh, when the Ford Motor Company began offering the Model T. Uh, the Model T is probably a good many of you might know, is the first mass produced automobile uh, that was affordable to the, you know, kind of quote unquote successful person. Uh, the vehicle's popularity soared. Uh, in 1908, only 5,896 Model Ts were sold. Uh, and then by 1916, sales had soared to 377,000 nationwide. And, and put that in perspective, that's a 6,200% increase uh, over the course of eight years. Uh, so to see that growth is absolutely incredible and, and we have seen the world change because of that. Uh, and also to put that kind of into perspective for today's times, uh, in 2022, estimates of how many cars there are in the world are around 1.45 billion. Uh, and then 20% of those are in the United States. So um, significant numbers there. And so let's kind of get into the 1940, especially the summer of 1914. Uh, the U.S. economy had fallen into recession with the outbreak of World War I, uh, and some entrepreneurial vehicle owners in Los Angeles began to pick up um, streetcar passengers in exchange for a jitney. Uh, a jitney is a colloquial term for just a, a five-cent piece, a nickel, uh, which was uh, the five-cent streetcar fare at that time as well. So if you ever seen Jitney before, that gives you a little insight as to what that, that actually means. Um, Jitney served a sort of hybrid model at that time with some drivers using their vehicles as a profession to transport others. Um, data is unfortunately a little bit hard to find for that period. Um, still though, reports at the time also indicate that many Jitneys made only um, one round trip per day, um, meaning that they were used for transportation from home to work and then back with the revenue generated usually to, to help offset the cost of that vehicle ownership. So in many ways, we can sort of look at this as uh, and view this as one of the earliest forms of what we would now consider 
carpooling or, or ride sharing. Um, that term takes shape as we'll, as we'll see, but that's maybe kind of the earliest iteration that we have of it. Uh, but unfortunately, the Jitney craze quickly died off with many of the local governments um, implementing license requirements and required liability bonds, uh, which could account for about 25 to 50 percent of Jitney driver earnings. So it became very cost you know, prohibitive to really uh, explore Jitney as a, as a service. So that's going to take us a big jump here. We're going to go into um, from 1914 to 1941. Um, the first instance of what we would now consider traditional carpooling, uh, whereby the institutions aided in the forming of those carpools, uh, that began in, in 1941 during World War II. And using a mixture of scare tactics and sex appeal and patriotism, uh, these car share club programs, uh, they had a campaign to encourage Americans to carpool to conserve fuel and other supplies for the war effort. And so what we're seeing on screen is some of the um, uh, imagery that was used. We're going to see a number of these kind of graphic pieces that, that have been created. So I think they're, they're pretty interesting for that time frame. And so uh, in May of 1941, President Roosevelt had established the Office of Petroleum Coordinator, the OPC. Uh, OPC was created to coordinate and centralize all government activities related to petroleum use. And so by July of 1941, one of OPC's industry committees organized the first known petroleum conservation effort. Uh, this campaign was launched on the East Coast with a $250,000 advertisement budget funded entirely by asking uh, motoring public to use 30% less gasoline. Uh, so the recommended actions included lowering drive speeds, taking care of your tires, which, which also helps with that conservation of rubber for the war, and then of course sharing rides. Um, so things like factories and companies were responsible for forming um, these car sharing clubs, but we also saw um, churches, homemakers, parent teacher associations, they were responsible for forming carpools to and from these uh, various um, uh, locations and various functions. So this is really, I think, when we see the first car sharing club exchange program and the first like self-dispatching system. So really interesting, really neat. And, and I think like with a, a graphic piece like we have over here on the right, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler, you know, if that, that doesn't get you thinking about getting into a carpool, uh, I'm not sure what does. So it's, it's interesting to see the uh, uh, the imagery used. Uh, so we have a few more here. Um, so by the industry's own admission, the effort was not terribly successful. A lack of public appreciation of the need to conserve fuel uh, that was cited as one of the leading challenges to overcome. And uh, the first drive to emphasize to the American people the necessity of gasoline conservation served one important purpose. It showed the industry itself the magnitude of this task and the growing need for long range sustained program of public education. So um, um, the boom in this American suburbs as well, uh, that was to come right after World War II. And with that, we, we then see this um, rise in car ownership and the growth of the American highway system. So you sort of see this, this process of, of, of how we get to where we're at um, over time. And so we're, we're, we're zipping through here. Um, so now that we've seen the impacts of war in carpooling, um, we're going to take a look at the 70s, where the United States experiences its first energy crisis. Um, so during the 1973 Arab-Israel War, Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, which you've probably heard, uh, imposed an embargo against the United States in retaliation for the U.S. decision to resupply the Israel military and gain leverage to the post-war peace negotiations. So throughout the fall and early winter of 73, President Nixon's administration uh, realized that action would need to be taken to reduce petroleum consumption. And so in January of 1974 specifically, Nixon signed the Emergency Highway uh, Energy Conservation Act, which mandated maximum speed limits of 55 miles per hour on public highways. This act was also the first instance where the US federal government began funding rideshare initiatives. Strategies to facilitate ride sharing included uh, employer sponsored commuter ride matching programs, things like fan pulling, HOV lanes, casual car pulling, and park and ride facilities. So, for the first time, uh, states were allowed to spend their highway funds on ride share demonstration projects. Uh, and in 1978, the Surface Transportation Assistance Act would eventually make funding for ride share initiatives permanent. Uh, so, in 78, that's interesting. 
Uh, so in the United States, these efforts saw modest success uh, during the energy crisis of the 70s with carpoolies carpooling uh, commute share peaking uh, in 1980 at 20.4%. Uh, uh, and from there, carpooling um, commute share dropped steadily and was only in like the 9.4% range by 2013. Okay, so, so we'll fast forward a bit from the 70s to bring us into the modern era of carpooling, but, but I think it's worth noting here that we continue to see this cycle throughout history that impacts and affects our travel options and our choices. Um, there might be conflicts or there might be wars that impact fuel prices. There's traffic congestion, there's road congestion, there are state and federal policy decisions. Uh, maybe the, the newest element of this conversation uh, is the concern over air quality. Um, so I mention all of these factors because these factors these are the factors that impact uh, each and every one of us. So I think being mindful of our history helps us make informed decisions for our future. And unfortunately, we have seen very recent times where conflict has um, created a, a change in fuel prices and a change in behavior. Um, so these are very real things that happen uh, that have um, pretty direct impacts on, on us and our commuting behavior. And okay, so we're gonna jump from uh, where we were to we're gonna fly through history and we're gonna go into 2007. So we made it through uh, Y2K, that was fine, 2007. Uh, we're gonna talk specifically about carpooling in the triangle, um, but we'll also need to talk about the statewide solutions for North Carolina to help sort of represent what the, the impacts are for the triangle region. So the NC Department of Transportation initially provided funding to, to develop um, the www.sharetheridenc.org uh, service, and that was in 2005, and they continue to support the program through today. Um, the program and the database are administered by Go Triangle, and back then that was formerly Triangle Transit. Um, so we're the provider of regional bus and ride sharing services in the Triangle region. Uh, the NCDOT Public Transportation Division awards grants and funds to local public transportation systems, and these help enable uh, systems to provide people to go to all 100 counties, um, access to education, access to job opportunities, access to healthcare. Uh, and so the launch of sharetheridenc.org was in 2007. And this has continued to evolve over time, but it has really been about um, providing uh, access uh, for, for many of the individuals throughout North Carolina. Um, so we see that from 2005, 2007, then we get to um, um, uh, the Emergency Ride Home Program, which was incorporated into the Share the Ride NC platform uh, around 2007. So that was interesting. It sounds like it was a, a program that was kind of operational on its own and then, and then kind of folded into um, Share the Ride NC for participants of the Triangle region. And, and we'll talk more about what Emergency Ride Home is if you've never heard of it. Um, good program, I'd like to talk about it. Um, so then we go to 2013, we had a rebranding of Share the Ride NC. So here on the screen, you'll see some of the, the different imagery that has been used over time. Let's see how they, the, just the Share the Ride NC brand has evolved over time. Uh, then we get to uh, Go Perks, uh, an incentive program was launched in 2015. Love to talk about Go Perks, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and, and I'll return to Share the Ride NC, but from now, now that we know kind of the history of carpooling, let's actually take a look at the benefits of carpooling. Um, so by having more people, oops, sure if that pops up on your screen, but I hit my keyboard. Uh, by having more people use one vehicle, uh, carpooling reduces each person's travel costs, such as fuel costs, tolls, and the stress of driving. Um, carpooling is also one of the more environmentally friendly and sustainable ways of commuting. Uh, sharing journeys reduces air pollution, reduces carbon emissions, traffic congestion, wear and tear on roads, and the need for parking spaces. So carpooling is just a win-win across the board. Uh, authorities often encourage carpooling, especially during periods of high pollution or high fuel prices. Um, and ride sharing is a good way to use up the full seating capacity of a car, which would otherwise remain unused if it were just the driver using that car. And I, you know, I think that's important because I think we see this a lot and you know, I'm just as guilty as everyone else, but you know, you'll be driving on a highway and you see that um, every single car just has the one person driving in it. I think even one of our slides earlier was um, uh, Uncle Sam was kind of yelling that to fill those empty seats. So it's uh, we, we have the vehicles, we have the space, we have the capacity. Uh, so it's it's really about how can we take advantage of that. 
And so to, to have this conversation of carpooling, I think we have to talk about how do you actually find a carpool, an uh, incredibly part, uh, important part of this, this puzzle. Uh, and so um, that's where Share the Ride NC can come in. And, and luckily it's easy to use, it's simple. Uh, we try to make this very user friendly. Um, so you can access Share the Ride NC through the web. Um, you can access it through mobile devices. There's the Share the Ride NC app on iOS and Android devices. So one way or the other, you should definitely be able to navigate your way to it. Um, you'll register by using your email address. And, and we always encourage you to use your work or your school email address. It is preferred. It's not mandatory by any stretch, uh, but it can help with um, the, the way you find matches and sort of the grouping of your matches. So using that work or, or school email address is really uh, a good step to making sure you have the quality matches that you want. Um, you enter in some information about your commute. So things like your origin address and your destination address, your schedule, the prefer preferred modes of transportation that you're looking at. So things like indicating if uh, you want to be the carpool driver or if you want to be the carpool passenger, that's important. Uh, and then you can also indicate things like if you're interested in finding a van pool or maybe a, a cycling partner. So share the right and see can really connect people together. That's really the heart of, of what the system is going to do. And so here's an example of a share the right and see user experience, uh, what it might look like. A user searches for commute options and sees how many carpool drivers or passengers um, share their commute. They can click on somebody's uh, uh, name and, and you can start to pop up and get some information uh, about them, learn a little bit more about them, and decide if you want to contact them. Um, share the right and see will only share a user's first name. It's really important for us. Um, all inf other information is optional to share. So if somebody wants to have an image or if they want to include their email address or a phone number, all of that is completely optional. Share the right and see will only show uh, an indiv individual's first name as they have it listed. Um, so we recommend connecting with a match through Share the Right NC, then discussing all the details of, of carpooling over possibly a, a meeting. Uh, Zoom or Teams can be a great way to meet people virtually. You can, of course, meet people in person. Uh, we typically encourage as a best practice meeting somebody in a public space, coffee shops. Uh, a lot of times you work near uh, the, 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 or you have the destination near the person. So maybe a cafe could be a good place to meet, meet somebody over lunch. Um, you can connect with as few or as many users as you like. Uh, your, meet, your matches are sorted using this algorithm to find the best matches possible. So I encourage usually just starting there at the top of your matches, and then you can work your way down and you can, you can reach out to the first person, see if that has an, a, a good success, or you can go down the line and reach out to you know, as many people as you like, but share the right and see again is this tool that helps get you in touch with other people and they can get in touch with you as well. So really important to talk about um, the tips for a successful carpool because now that you know how to find the carpool, um, getting into a carpool is, is that's just one component of this, uh, of a successful carpool, uh, but a lot of carpools, successful carpools at least follow um, these tips that we have listed here on screen. Um, so things like agreeing on your schedules and your routes, that's an important discussion to have. If the driver doesn't like driving on the highway or rather take the scenic way, that might take longer. So you wanna make sure you're on the same page as far as schedules and routes. Uh, you wanna know what time everyone's being picked up and what time are being dropped off and what time are you meeting your carpools. So an important part of that conversation, schedules and routes. Um, things like the cost, very important part of the conversation. Share the ride and see, it's completely free. So there's no cost to you share the ride and see, so there's no cost associated with, with that system. Um, but carpooling often has costs associated with it. So figure out payment options, like uh, you can do those digital payments, of course, there's plenty of services to, to manage that. Uh, for digital payment transfers, there's cash, of course, but determine if there's even going to be costs. Sometimes carpools, you know, one person uh, might drive one day, another person might drive an another day, and so people can take turns as far as which vehicle is being used, so that's one option to manage costs. Um, but yeah, have that, uh, that conversation about costs up front. Um, and, and, and that will just help it be a more successful um, carpool. Um, and that kind of goes along with some of the carpool policies that we encourage people to discuss as they're getting into their carpooling uh, habits is, is talk about things like that are important for you. Also, is smoking allowed? Uh, is, is music allowed? Or what kind of music is, is allowed? Or what kind of music can be played? Or how loud? Um, things like food, are you allowed to eat in the car or not? Um, will there be planned stops along the way? So all of these little decisions can help 
you know, uh, make that carpool that much more successful. It can it can be a frustrating experience for users if um, if if these policies aren't being met. So so establish them up front, and that and that will make sure everyone's happy and and, and doing well. Uh, and this kind of falls in line with essentially this basic rule of life, I think, is is establish communication. You need to communicate, communicate, communicate. So you know, share a phone number, share cell phone numbers, email each other, figure out what system of communication is going to work best for you. Is it texting? Is it setting up an email the day before? These will help make you very successful. Is just communicate, you know, like, like everything in life, I think. Communicate uh, better and you will be happier. Um, so a really important part of this conversation is, of course, safety. So I'm going to break this up into two kind of categories here. So we first talk about vehicle safety. Um, does the does the driver have insurance? That's something that's important. Is there maybe a small medical kit that that uh, is on the vehicle that can make you feel a little bit better? Uh, what happens if you have a flat tire? Um, uh, does the driver have AAA services? Things like that. Um, these little decisions can, of course, help make that that. Uh, everyone feels safer and it can help uh, handle an emergency situation that much better. Um, we'll talk about emergency ride home in a little bit, which is a, another option for uh, those what if emergencies that happen. But yes, yeah, think, think of like uh, your personal safety there. Um, and, and so that, that kind of leads me to talk about one of the most common questions that, that we get when we talk about share the ride and see is, you know, how safe is share the ride and see. Um, so, so it's incredibly safe. I've, I've, luckily, we've never had any issues. And so I think it's been a fantastic tool to connect users together. Um, that said, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense to just make sure you feel comfortable getting into a vehicle with somebody that might be a stranger. You know, oftentimes these are people that are your, your neighbors or they might be your coworkers or they work near you. So these are people that you probably engage with in some capacity, but maybe never even realize it. Um, but nonetheless, I encourage you to you know, share the name and contact information of the people that are in your carpool. Um, um, so share them with, you know, family and friends and your employers. Um, and then another really good option is sort of taking advantage of technology, which, which I'm a big fan of, of course, is most phones have a share your location option. So we'll link some instructions for the iOS and Android devices about how you can share your address with other people. But that's just another level of security to make sure you feel comfortable um, riding with you know, what could be potentially strangers, but also share the right and see you're not required to get into any vehicle with somebody if you're not comfortable with that decision. So all we're doing is with, uh, with share the right and see is we're trying to connect individuals together. They can make informed decisions, use best practices when it comes to meeting somebody and then make some decisions from there. And so that kind of leans into respect. You know, some people look at carpooling maybe in the same way that they look at transit riding, where maybe they just don't want to talk to somebody or they want to focus on their work. And, and that's kind of what they're going to do. Um, other carpoolers, though, they might love to talk. They might play music. They want to play podcasts. I think it's really important to mutually agree and respect each other's uh, because, you know, we're all different. So we all have different needs. So talk it out. Make sure you're respecting everyone's wishes. Um, Chapel, uh, Go Chapel Hill has a, a fantastic program, this Vets on the Move program, and they've given out earbuds to vets to help reduce the amount of noise that they hear uh, when they're commuting. Uh, and so I think solutions like that are just fantastic that could be implemented for carpooling as well. Uh, lastly, brag. Carpooling only works if you find somebody to carpool with. And so the best way to do that is to get people into Share the Ride and See. So, um, you know, you've, you've done it. You're, you're carpooling. Make sure that you give yourself a pat on the back. So post that on social media. You know, I think, I think kind of bragging about um, being a carpooler is well earned. And so um, sharing that with others will give them the encouragement, maybe the nudge that they would need to participate and share the ride and see. So yeah, get out there and let's make some noise. Um, so some other, some other items that are tied into ride sharing are programs that we offer. Um, so share the ride and see is absolutely more than ride sharing, especially here in the Triangle region. And these are some of the most important programs we can talk about. So emergency ride home. Emergency ride home gives smart commuters, like people who carpool and take transit and van pool and bike to work, um, we can give them a free ride home in case they have an emergency. It's up to six times per year. It's completely free, and it's a really important way to make sure people feel um, um, secure in choosing the uh, smart commute option. Um, so emergency ride home, real lifesaver. Then we have programs like the Go Perks and Center program. It was designed to motivate and reward smart commuting behavior, things like carpooling. Uh, it's a fantastic program. It's housed on Share the Ride NC, and you can earn points, and you can get rewards, and it's just an absolutely fantastic program. 
So I highly encourage you to learn more about that. We have items like one-time trip matching. Uh, this can be really important um, um, because not everyone's in need of that nine to five Monday through Friday commute option. Maybe you're looking to get to the, the football game or the concert and you just need to take that one time trip and you'd love to share that ride with somebody and you could split costs of parking at a venue or something like that. So a um, one-time trip matching available through Share the Ride and See. And that can be great for people who are not necessarily looking for your traditional nine to five types of commutes. Um, so you can learn more about all of these services um, through the gotriangle.org slash services and programs. We'll drop that link into chat as well. And so this slide, I think, is probably the most important slide that we're going to talk about today. Um, I think we've Hopefully you learned a lot about carpooling so far. I hope this has been informative, uh, but if I'm being honest, I, I, I've really kind of been marketing carpooling to you today uh, because I just want more people carpooling. Uh, and to do that, I think there are two really important marketing tactics that we're leaning on. The first, cute possums. Uh, I think these possums, they've done probably 90% of the work for me today. So um, that has been tremendously helpful. <laughs> so you can, you can do no wrong with possums, right? Uh, second, we need to figure out why you should carpool. Um, so that's why I hope everyone can take a moment to think about what it takes to motivate you to, to choose carpooling as an option. And I got some graphics here and I'll sort of spell out a little bit of what these mean, but you know, first and foremost, saving money. Um, I think everybody likes to save money. Uh, uh, um, it's kind of the no brainer option of why you would want to carpool. Um, it's as simple as every time you add one person into the vehicle, you can split your cost of a commute in half. And splitting your cost in half is fantastic. And if you can add more people to your carpool, the prices just continue to go down. And so saving money, we have learned that that is one of the biggest motivators for why people choose alternative commutes. Um, so something easy to, easy to, to incorporate into, into your life is saving money. Um, uh, next could be reducing fuel consumption. Uh, we know that fuel is a limited commodity, and so um, um, we can do our part to help reduce that fuel consumption. Carpooling is a fantastic way of doing that. Uh, we, by carpooling, we are taking single occupancy vehicles, SOVs as we like to call them. We're taking SOVs off the road. Um, and that's very important as we look towards kind of a bigger picture item of, of just fuel consumption and how can we reduce that. Um, I think reducing fuel consumption also ties into sort of this, the earth kind of imagery that I have there um, is the environmental concerns. Um, there's, there's probably too much to even talk about in this webinar, but to, to say the least, uh, we are in a, a place where we really need to focus on the environmental concerns and what we can do and the choices that we have available. Carpooling is just one of those really easy choices to make if we have concerns of the environment. Um, so, so whatever, you know, if that's one of your motivators, and I think I think it should be, it's there. Carpooling can really make a big, big difference, and ensure the right and see can help you realize some of the impacts of your smart commuting choices because you can track those trips and you can see what kind of impact you're having. Um, so uh, another thing is fewer vehicles on the road can help save the lives of wildlife, like our beloved possums. Um, so we haven't had a possum back here in a little bit, so I'll just throw one in here. So many injured possums have been killed by well-meaning people who find a catatonic animal and then they assume the worst. So the best thing you can do if you do find a, a possum or an injured one, uh, maybe apparently dead playing possum, if you will, is to leave it in a quiet place. Uh, or you can leave it alone even uh, with a clear exit. Uh, in minutes or hours, a lot of times these possums will regain consciousness and escape quietly, quietly on their own. So I, I do like the concept of bring up some space, making sure that if possums are on the road, that the fewer vehicles there are, the better it is for them. So, so that's kind of a win-win. Um, another thing, and I have this car battery kind of graphic to represent this, is uh, carpooling might be situational. Um, maybe your car battery died and it can just be really annoying to replace it. Um, so consider carpooling whenever you just have something that's just kind of an annoyance, um, like replacing your battery. Um, Carpooling can just come in and save the day and it can make your life a lot easier and you might like it and you might stick with it. So really take a look at when you have these like little hurdles that kind of pop up in your life and, and you're just not sure what to do. Um, carpooling kind of get in there and save the day a little bit. Um, so so I, I added this graphic, the, the need help kind of figure of a, a really important item for us to think about is, is that a lot of people don't have the luxury of choice that many of us do have. So many of us, we have, 
a car. We maybe have two cars and carpooling doesn't necessarily have to be incorporated into our lives. Um, but a lot of people don't have that choice. Um, uh, you know, uh, limited access to transit services can, can really you know, tie somebody up to figure out how how they're going to handle their transportation needs. And carpooling can come in there and really save the day. And I, I've seen it a number of times where somebody says, you know, I, I wanted to accept this new job that I got an offer and it sounded like a really good opportunity. Uh, I didn't have access to transit, so I wasn't sure what to do. Found a carpool partner through Share the Ride and Seam. And that's just an absolutely wonderful feeling. So think about that too. You know, if you're driving, you're alone in your vehicle. Um, um, you can open that up and invite somebody to be your carpool partner, and that can be absolutely life-changing for them. Um, so appreciate when those of us who maybe have the luxury of choice. I think that's an important important factor to consider here. Uh, another item, the little singers down there at the bottom, is maybe you're searching for that perfect carpool karaoke partner. Um, you know, we know that Bohemian Rhapsody. That's not going to sing itself, right? So dig in. Get, uh, let's, let's sing some tunes with your carpool partner. It can be silly, but if you have a good carpool, carpool partner uh, to belt along with, I, I think it's fantastic. I have, uh, I've been kicked out of carpools because of my singing, but you know, I still enjoyed it. Uh, another option to consider is preferred parking. Um, so a lot of organizations and employers, they might offer preferred parking. That in and of itself can be the motivational factor that you might need to, to consider carpooling, getting that front space and a massively crowded parking lot that can be uh, a really nice incentive. So look and see what, what's out there for you. Uh, and maybe the last and maybe a little bit cheesy option I wanted to throw it in here is uh, I do think uh, thinking about the children, thinking about the future um, of your choices now can, can have a really big impact. Uh, I talked earlier about you know forming these naturally forming car pools, um, these family pools, fan pools. And I think they're wonderful, uh, um, but going out of your way to, to carpool with others, potentially strangers, um, it can be really, really satisfying. So we know that people naturally carpool. We, we all do that. You do it to take your kids to school. You do it to some, sometimes go to work with a partner. You do it to go to the grocery store. You do it for all of these different errands that you might run, but those are naturally forming carpools and they're fantastic. But you know, it doesn't really take a whole lot to convince you to do that. So we encourage people to think of what can I do to change my behavior that actually has a, a really meaningful impact. So whatever it is that motivates you, um, I hope that you're leaving this webinar with more information to make that right choice for you. Uh, so hopefully that's been helpful. So I think we're going to hand this back over to Mason now and uh, we'll go into a Q&A, I think. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, great presentation. Um, Learned a lot of incredible stuff, uh, including uh, that possums can't catch Lyme disease or rabies. I know it's not carpool related, but I thought that was a really awesome fact. Um, so yeah, we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, I do want to remind everyone that if you do have a question, uh, please to put it in the Q&A section of the, the Zoom. It'll be at the bottom panel, Q&A. Um, it just helps us organize our question and answering a lot better to make sure we get yours taken care of. Um, so with that, our first question, Paul, is someone asked, I would like to encourage carpooling at my office. Um, so what can I do? What are the what are steps I can take? That's a great question. Yeah, I think one of the, the benefits of Share the Right NC is that we can have customized versions of Share the Right NC for employers. And so we literally throughout the state have hundreds of them. Um, so Duke University or you know large universities, UNC, uh, every, all the universities, uh, they have customized versions of Share the Ride and See. Our large employers, our IBMs and Citrixes and American Tobacco, they have customized versions of Share the Ride and See. And and it's it's wonderful because one, it shows that your employer is um, supporting and endorsing this smart commuting option. Um, so it's always good to have your employer say, hey, we've you know we're, we're working with sure the right and see to have an option that's that's best for you um, and when we have the customized employer sites that we've created um, really really beneficial because users then have the option of who they can match with so and that's why earlier when i said that um, registering with your employer email address or your university email address that's great because that can tie you into one of these customized versions of share the right and see that we've created and so if you would rather just match up with people of your employer or of your university or, or your institution you as a user can make that that choice. And so that's one of these tools that we just try to make sure everyone feels 
successful with when it comes to finding matches. So yeah, customized versions of Share the Right NC, fantastic. Um, if you have questions about that, we'll have my you know, contact information on screen later. All of the different TDM partners that we have can help answer that question, but we'd love to help you um, set that up with your employers too. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, so we have another question. This one is, have any campaigns focused on, quote, making money by carpooling as a way of attracting drivers? Um, we haven't. We have strayed away from from sort of the, the monetary component of ride matching. Um, uh, yeah, because we know there's sort of a market that has been created for that. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely not in it for the you know financial component of of when we think of carpooling but um i do think that's just it is one of those really really important conversations that everyone should have it's one of the first things that we we encourage people to to talk about whenever they are looking at their carpool opportunities um but you know i think sometimes with the one time trip matching we might see a little bit more of the user base in there um that you know what's really nice about and i didn't i didn't demo this today but i'd, I'd be glad to meet with anyone to show it off is um in the one time trip matching you can list a cost that could be associated with the trip so that can help identify exactly what up cost might be associated to the trip as opposed to you know, share the right and see that the traditional part of it where you're just connecting with people um, but the, the the short answer is no we haven't uh, really incorporated the, the financial component of a campaign to talk about that okay that sounds good um we have another question uh so this person asked i set up an account over the summer but there were no matches um, I wasn't sure about next steps, so I kind of abandoned it. Are there any tips that you would give uh, for this person to take? Yeah, you know, I'll say that during the pandemic, we just saw a um, a pretty significant decline of of our active user base. So, with Share the Right and See, we try really hard to keep people engaged with the with the site and stay uh, stay active in there um, because. You know, we, we want people to join Share the Right NC. We want there to be a kind of a big, healthy pool of people to to search this database of to connect with. And so the, the pandemic was a pretty big hit to, to us and Share the Right NC. Um, we have definitely seen numbers going back up and, and fairly rapidly as well. Um, so as, as different organizations and different employers have been uh, implementing their return to work decisions, um, um, we're seeing, you know, obviously more people coming into work because of that. And, and for that same reason, we're seeing that, that increase in share the right NC. So, so the answer there is check back. Um, um, you can, you can try your best to sometimes modify what your commute might be. So, you know, sometimes you might say, let me look from my home address to my work address. Let me see if there are options there. Hopefully there are, but if there aren't, maybe consider um, uh, an alternative location that you can maybe get to, maybe a park and ride lot, possibly, um, maybe a, 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 a road or a, a origin that's closer to, to a main thoroughfare. That can sometimes be a factor, uh, but mainly I just say keep trying. Awesome. Um, so our next question, and this one is, um, and maybe you've experienced this, Paul, or um, I've heard of this and, and can offer suggestions. Um, if I want to run commute, um, can I set up a, quote, carpool with someone to take my heavy bag and laptop? <laughs> I haven't I haven't necessarily heard of people using sure the right and see uh, in in that sense. You know, I think that we have tried to um, connect different people for um, maybe some different mobility needs. If um, somebody um, could maybe use a hand, you know, getting in and out of a vehicle, um, you know, I think it's share the right and see can be a good way to find um, some some people who would share that same commute. Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't necessarily heard of it in the sense of like kind of helping in that capacity of like just helping with bags and stuff. So, um, but you know, I think it's um, always part of the conversation is if you can find you know the, the perfect match for you, maybe that's a part of the conversation you want to have. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I like that being uh, not only eco friendly, not driving, but also being super healthy by choosing to run. Um, I just added some great stuff there. So we have another question. So COVID numbers in my county are rising again. Um, it's making it very hard to persuade people to share space or ride transit and carpool. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to convince people of safety or comfortability with this? 
Yeah, the, the, the COVID conversation has been really, really important as we've looked at um, you know, ride matching and ride share services. Um, so, so I think that's one of the really nice things and one of the really big benefits of a system like Share the Ride and See is you can find a specific individual uh, or, or individuals that you could commute with on a regular basis. So that way, if you're sharing this same space uh, everyone can mutually agree on what makes them feel safe. So, you know, are you doing testing? Is everyone wearing masks? But those kinds of options, that can be a conversation everyone can have. And if everyone feels safe and secure, you can get in the vehicle, you can make that carpool trip. Um, but you're sharing that space with um, the same people, or, you know, uh, day, day after day. And, and so I think that can be um, something that really helps people feel a little bit better because that's one of the, the challenges I think with transit is, is you know, sometimes you're going to get onto a transit route and, and you might not necessarily know um, anything about the other people that are riding transit. You know, are they vaccinated? Are they masked up? And every day might be a little bit different while carpool, you can help sort of find that narrow in on the solutions that make you feel a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, all about just finding what works for you, uh, which is the beauty of carpool. You can really customize it. Um, so we have another question. There's two questions that are pretty similar, so I'll combine them and kind of ask them together. Um, so uh, someone asked, I want to carpool, but as a single parent, my trips have to be flexible and match up my kids' needs. Um, so can I offer one-way trips, to either carpool to work sites rather than round trip offers only? Uh, and, and kind of picking back off that, we also have people asking, you know, has anyone ever used share the ride for errands? Um, not necessarily just going to and back from a work site to a neighborhood. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can use share the ride and see for anything and everything. It can be as versatile as, as you want it to be. Um, and so that gives you tremendous flexibility. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, we don't think of, of choosing smart commuting options like carpooling necessarily is just limited to your nine to five Monday through Friday types of commutes. It can literally be anything. So these one-time trips, these errands, um, maybe you do it at odd hours, um, things like that. You know, the, the beauty of Share the Ride and See is you can you can customize your search, and then you can see uh, somebody else that maybe shares that same um, that same trip. So you know, being able to find them, that's kind of the the role of Share the Ride and See. Um, and so it can be fantastic. So even if your schedules change and they're, you know, Monday is different than Tuesday and Tuesday is different than Wednesday, that's perfectly fine. You can really have a customized commute to see what's out there. And 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 you can search for more than just one type of trip. You don't have to pick one origin and one destination. You can list multiple origins. You can list multiple destinations. You can have different schedules. So the, the beauty is that the flexibility of Share the Right NC should really open up um, a lot of opportunities for you. Um, I would say that probably the majority of people in Share the Right NC, but definitely not everybody, <clears throat> the majority of everyone is kind of looking at that, that nine to five Monday through Friday type commute. So you're going to have a lot of success in that category um, whenever you have off hour, off peak hour searches, the uh, you might see um, a fewer number of matches, but yeah, the key is to get in there and try and see what you can find. Terrific. Um, our next question um, is more about our emergency ride home program. So I know you mentioned the our emergency ride home program, but can you tell me more about it? Um, for example, does my employer need to be registered? And if so, how do I do that? To order, what are the tips for getting started with that? Yeah, so, and that's a great question. I think Emergency Ride Home is just one of the most important programs that we've ever been able to offer. Um, there are different regions of North Carolina that do not offer Emergency Ride Home, and so the Triangle region offering it, um, and that means Durham, Orange, and, and, and Wake County. Um, the fact that that this region offers it has been a real game changer for a lot of people, um, knowing that they can have a ride home in case they do have an emergency, really, really important. Um, so we do ask that you that you um, register your employer with us. Um, we can still give you your first ride for free. So if you've, if you've never had your employer registered with the, the program, um, getting your employer registered just opens up more um, um, opportunities for those emergency ride trips if you need them. Um, one of the links Kim had posted earlier, so you might have to scroll up through chat, the gotriangle.org slash services and programs or gotriangle.org slash ERH. Uh, that's very informative. That'll have a lot of information about the emergency ride home program. You can see the massive list of employers that we already have registered with the program. If your employer isn't in that list, 
The registration process is really easy. Again, there's no cost. There's no catch to this. R really, the, the purpose of why we want to know who your employer is, is we want to make sure that your employer knows about the emergency ride home program. And we want to make sure that they're um, distributing that information to all of the employees. So, so we want to make sure everyone is knowledgeable about this program, because it really is just one of those, you know, you know, if if you if you wanted to carpool or if you wanted to take transit into work and uh, you're worried about you know what happens if my child gets sick or what if I have to stay late and that's going to cause me to miss my carpool, um, what do I do? So people choose just to drive alone to solve that that what if issue, um, but emergency ride home says you know what don't worry about that we'll, we'll we'll get you home. Awesome. And so for this service you have to live in Durham, Orange, or Wake County, correct? Uh, live or have a destination there. So yeah. Awesome. Um, I think we have uh, uh, time for one more question. Um, so this one's about our perks program. Um, what's the budget look like for you? Are you constrained by a funding agency with the types of items you can buy? Um, and are people, you know, really motivated by these prizes? Do they? Do you feel like it's a success with them? Yeah. So the funding is it's it's interesting. So we essentially we offer four hundred dollars worth of prizes every single month. Um, those sponsorships come from local businesses and establishments, uh, and so we absolutely love our sponsors of the Go Perks program. Um, and the Go Perks program offers incentives to, to to local businesses. So that's really important for us because what that means is every prize offering that you see uh, it goes back into local establishments. So uh, we're keeping that money local, the sponsorships are local, the, the, where the money goes is, is local. So very, very important for us, it feels like a very triangle-based program. We're not offering your Amazon gift cards and your Starbucks gift cards. Um, so that's really, really important for us. And, and as far as the success is concerned, uh, I, I can't even put it into words how important Go Perks is. I I get to nerd out. I'm the back end guy on Share the Right and see, and so I get to see all the data, and so I can see the impacts that Go Perks has had. We see tremendous uh, information as commuters are tracking their trips. So we can see what kind of greenhouse gas reduction we're causing. We can see how many calories people are burning by choosing um, active commutes. Um, so it's a fantastic program. Can't recommend it enough. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Um, so. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping up here. Uh, before we hop off, um, I want to mention that we have a survey that we're going to be dropping a link to in the chat. Um, everyone who completes the survey uh, will be able to receive a carpool toolkit. That's the cool handy dandy notebook that Paul had at the beginning of the of the uh, presentation. Um, we'll email that to you. Um, but you also will be entered into a prize drawing for a carpool uh, kit itself. Uh, and that's going to have things like lights, a small med kit, water bottles, and several items. Um, they're going to be helpful for you to navigating the carpool world. Um, so you'll be seeing it on screen here in a second, but also it's linked in the chat. And so please complete this before Wednesday, October or August 31st at 5 p.m. Um, and so we do really ask you to complete this. It helps us you know, improve our Mission Impossible series um, and see where we need to improve or what other information we need uh, to work to provide you. And so, again, I want to thank all of the attendees that have joined today. Um, a reminder that this recording will be posted to YouTube soon within 24, 48 hours. And so please share this with your organizations, families, anyone that you know that may be interested in a carpool. Um, and then if there are any questions that were asked that we did not get to today, um, we will follow up with um, or feel free to email us at our contact information. Um, we will make sure to get those questions answered for you. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Uh, I hope that you not only learned a lot about carpools, uh, but hopefully learned a lot about possums and have a new respect for this animal. <laughs> and if it's okay, actually, I'm gonna close it out real quickly. There's two things I wanted to show. So um, whenever we were sending out the communications for this, a lot of people came back to us, a lot of information about possums was shared with us and I absolutely loved it. So I had received an email um, concerning possums and carpooling, um, I, which I know is kind of confusing when you see possums and carpooling in a title of an email, <laughs> but uh, but we have a lot of possum lovers out there. So Rachel with the city of Durham, she encouraged us to consider wildlife bridges as we think about urban planning, uh, because it is a means of helping possums and other creatures safely cross roads during their commutes. So I thought that was a, a nice way to tie it all in. And then lastly, we have our contact information here, and I'll close it out by just playing a video of this possum that comes and visits my house every, every other night. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Mason, and thanks uh, everyone. Really appreciate your time today. <laughs>